Okay, um, hello everybody. Oh, new face. <laughs> um, uh, first of announcement, so today I put also task number five on the student portal. So all five tasks are now there and it's of course up to you when you want to do it. Final deadline of, of every task. Um, Okay, then uh, let me come back to what we discussed last time. I try to, to motivate a little bit why we are interested in expectation values. Um, for example, in a quantum mechanical expectation value like this, where this here is the lowest state of a quantum system, which in quantum field theory one typically calls vacuum. And this is an arbitrary operator. And now we specified last time the task to having a time independent operator here. And then I've, we have rewritten it, this uh, several times, um, actually in a more and more complicated way. Um, and finally, we ended up with the following. So this one can write as a limit of this beta parameter going to infinity. Um, but before putting capital N to infinity, and then um, there is a function of this operator we are interested in, and it depends on beta and n. And this quantity here I have basically derived last time. So this is a ratio of um, a multiple integral. So one has capital N integrals here, so this become more and more. One integrates over all spatial variables. Um, then we have this operator here which does not depend on time and uh, well then in a quantum system then it depends on the positions um, can also depend on the momenta then this formula would look slightly more complicated but it's also straightforward how to do that so for the simplicity let me assume this here depends on uh, positions only and then there is an exponential function which involves here this minus tau, which is beta over n. And then a sum over all uh, space points, 1 half m xj plus 1 minus xj divided by this delta tau here um, square plus v of xj. Um, there's one more bracket here. And this whole thing is divided basically by the same object without the operator. Is 
this a meaningful expression for given capital N? And the second question, and this is what I will address in a moment, and the second question which I will not address is the, the mathematical question, can, is this limit here, capital N to infinity, that really one has here infinitely many integrals, is this well defined? This I will not address, but just that you have a rough idea what, uh, what mathematicians think about that. Um, well, let me first say something historical. So these path integrals were introduced, as far as I know, by Richard Feynman. And uh, he did not bother too much about whether this is mathematically fully well defined. Um, However, meanwhile, this theory of path integrals has been developed and, uh, and it, it turns out that indeed this limit here is a well-defined process. So one can do that, one can evaluate seriously these path integrals. Um, for quantum mechanical processes, that's well defined, mathematically well defined. I will afterwards, you know, I mean, this is also not a lecture on quantum mechanics. What we are after is uh, to, to have a tool to do some calculations in quantum field theory. As far as I'm aware of, nobody has demonstrated really that quantum field theoretical path integrals are mathematically well defined. I mean, this is one further step that one does not integrate here over one degree of freedom, but one integrates over degrees of freedom per space point, uh, taking then the, lim the continuum limit. Um, this is something uh, where it's, it has, I think it has not been shown yet mathematically that this is well defined what one is doing there. Um, so this is this, nonetheless, I mean, Physicists use that as a very useful tool, um, so probably it is well defined, but uh, well, mathematically it's a little bit more tricky. So that's the first thing uh, what I want to address is for a given capital N is at least, or at least these multiple integrals here well defined. And then um, I want to show you at least a little bit, I want to give you an idea why one can do that even numerically. Okay, so what do you think, what could, uh, what could prohibit a calculation of such integrals here? When can it go wrong? Any idea? When do integrals go wrong? So, I mean, let me be specific here. These are integrals from minus infinity to plus infinity for any variable here. It blows up. Right, so it can go wrong if it blows up. So let's convince ourselves that the integrand does not blow up, that the integrand has an upper limit. And, well, there are two things which can happen. Either it can blow up at a specific value of the uh, integration point, or it blows up because one integrates from minus infinity to plus infinity. I mean, the integrand, of course, can also be finite, but if it's not really going to zero at the integration boundaries, then probably the area is also not finite. Okay, so in general it can blow up, exactly. So let's see what it does. Well, let's first look um, at the things which are, which are well defined. Well, we have, so what we have in mind is, I talk about this here, but we have in mind to having beta big and positive and having capital N anyway, this is a natural number, uh, this is positive. So if you look at this exponent here, we have exponent minus something positive, and then we have a sum here. This is the mass of the particle, which we're looking at, also positive. This here is a square, that's also positive. 
So if we only look at this part here, we have e to the minus something positive. And if we look at the integration boundaries, if one of the xj's becomes very, very big or minus something very, very big, becomes close to plus infinity or minus infinity, this term, if xj becomes, uh, if one of these components becomes big and this is fixed, because this is then only the next integral, um, well, this here becomes bigger and bigger, which means the whole thing becomes more and more negative and the exponential e to the power of minus something big becomes smaller and smaller. So this here is very good. How about this? Well, actually this can be a problem. However, now comes one thing where quantum field theory is much better than quantum mechanics. In quantum field theory, definitely one wants interactions which are bounded from below. One actually wants that a vacuum state exists, a state of lowest energy. And the easiest way uh, to achieve that is to have interaction terms which have a lower boundary. Let's apply that also here to quantum mechanics because anyway we are interested in generalizing that to quantum field theory. We are not so much interested in the quantum mechanics itself. What do we have to do to make sure that something is bounded from below? Well, the Hamiltonian of our system is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The kinetic energy is anyway bounded from below. If the particle is not moving, its kinetic energy is zero. You cannot get negative there. So the only problem, the potential problem, is the potential. So we assume that the potential energy, which is V, um, is bounded from below. Which means that there exists um, bounded from below means there is a lower limit. Actually it does not matter whether I know this limit. The only important thing is that I know there is one. So there exists an object which I call V0, which satisfies that V0 is smaller than V of xj for all spatial coordinates. Okay, this means bounded from below. Well, can this be now a problem? Well, let's see. I mean, suppose this V0 is nonetheless very, very large and negative. Then if you look at the numerator here, well, you could pick up something which is very big but negative times minus, which means this could yield a contribution which is very, very big and positive in the exponent. So again, this could cause uh, something which blows up. However, the good thing is we are not interested here in this numerator. We are interested here in this ratio. And if something constant blows up in the numerator, it also blows up here in the denominator and it actually cancels out. So I can rewrite that in the following way. Um,
So I have the same um, function here. And now I just write down a different expression and you will then see in a moment that it's the same as before. Um, so again, I do, um, well, I calculate this ratio. I have again the very same one, the very same integration variables. An operator which depends on J, and now I write down a new a new expression in the exponent. So what have I done now? Basically I have multiplied here the numerator with an exponent minus beta over n and then this sum times minus v0. All these are constants, they do not depend on the x variables. So I can write this just as a factor in front of the integral up here and the same thing appears here in the denominator. So this here is the same expression as before. I have essentially just multiplied the whole thing by a constant. But now, what I have achieved is that this expression here, since this is a lower limit of v, this here is larger than zero. This part here is anyway a square, so the whole thing is anyway, now the whole thing is larger than zero. And therefore because of this overall exponent here, this here is smaller than zero. And we have, so we have basically, now if we split this here up in two exponents, we have one exponent which is definitely smaller than one. This is an exponent of minus something positive. This is smaller than one. And we have an exponent, this term here, which goes to zero. Then, uh, then we have an expression, the whole exponent, which goes to zero if the axis in this integration limits are reached. So this whole thing, now both in the numerator and in the de denominator, is something which becomes very, very small times something which has as an upper limit one. So the whole expression, the whole integrand, so first of all, the, yeah, the whole integrand is basically has an upper bound and um, vanishes if one reaches the integration boundaries. And this is all you need. So there is no point in the whole integration where the integrand blows up. 
it's always bounded by 1 because 1 always takes exponent of something negative and if one reaches the integration boundaries the whole expression becomes 0 and actually it goes uh, quadratically to 0 so that's an uh, it goes with e, it goes it goes Gaussian to 0 e to the minus the integration variable squared so this is absolutely well defined concerning a finite number of integrations and that it's well defined then doing this limit capital N to infinity this is something you have to believe now mathematicians have shown that this makes sense um, actually this limitation here from the mathematical point of view is stronger than needed one can give a well-defined meaning also to path integrals which are not bounded from below which uh, brings me to one last historical remark Feynman has introduced that and he has introduced it having in mind quantum field theory but he also wanted to show that this is useful for quantum mechanics what's very easy with the path integrals or as easy as other formalisms of quantum mechanics is to do the harmonic oscillator well the reason why this is easy is if this V here is quadratic in the position in position this is what a harmonic potential is then all these are just Gaussian integrals and one can do this analytically and obtain a solution for example for these quantities but actually for any quantity you want to calculate uh, for any meaningful quantum mechanical question one can basically calculate the corresponding path integrals um, as integrating a couple of Gaussians so this was very nice um, now comes the drawback there, is, there are basically two problems in quantum mechanics which one can solve analytically one is the harmonic oscillator what do you think is the other one? hydrogen atom hydrogen atom, exactly and this is of, of course even more practical value because the hydrogen atom is the hydrogen atom, this is something you can observe um, the hydrogen atom does not have a potential which is bounded from below the hydrogen atom goes with 1 over r so if r gets closer and closer to the origin and for sure I integrate over everything so I do integrate over the origin then this condition here is violated and Feynman of course looked at that problem and he looked uh, onto that for several years and in the beginning actually got disappointed about his ideas with path integrals because he could not solve the hydrogen atom problem you know if you invent something new and cannot even solve the most elementary things what all the inventors of quantum mechanics were proud about that they could solve that uh, you feel a little bit desperate with your new method um, and the problem is because this is not bounded from below uh, however one can show that then uh, one can apply some tricks to these path integrals and uh, basically rewrite it such that in the end uh, one can show it's well defined what one is doing there and it turned out that it was just not as easy as people originally thought if one does it correctly and this was later on actually solved by uh, Richard Feynman and Hagen Kleinert who is now a professor in Berlin uh, he, was his po he was Feynman's postdoc at that time so these two guys they figured out how to solve the hydrogen atom uh, with a path integral language this is actually of no practical use concerning quantum field theory so don't get me wrong this is not just a historical remark you know if one introduces something new one wants at least to figure out what of the old stuff still works and for some years it looked as if uh, this formulation is not as good as traditional quantum mechanics but actually it is so nowadays one knows how also to do the hydrogen atom um, for quantum field theory it's pretty irrelevant because there one anyway wants uh, potentials which are bounded from below um, 
Okay, so from that point of view, uh, for our aim, this is good enough. Okay, so this was the um, well, the conceptual issue is is what we have written down well defined at all. Um, okay, again, what I will not want to show you is uh, that when capital N goes to infinity, that it's still well defined. However, let me say one more thing. Um, the mathematicians did not only have um, as a motivation to make this particles well defined that they uh, well that they wanted to support Feynman's idea of doing that for quantum mechanics. Actually, it turns out that very very similar path integrals one can formulate in statistical theory. If one looks at uh, at random walk processes, like Brownian motion, uh, like Lagerba equations, maybe one of, some of you know what that is. Um, actually, nowadays this is very very fancy to use that in the theory of finance. So how uh, things on the stock market develop and so on. One can describe this very nicely by random processes and for that it's very useful to rephrase that um, in path integrals and then do some elementary calculation with that. And for that of course it's very useful to show that this is mathematically well defined. Um, and if you are clever enough you can get a Nobel Prize in economics for, for that. Um, okay, so actually happen. Um, good, so this is something uh, which came here as a result from quantum mechanics, but actually nowadays uh, such ways of calculating uh, things have a very widespread applications. Good, next question. How to do such integrals in practice? <coughs> Okay, so let's first let me finish here uh, what I want to say. Um, so this here is definitely for a given capital N, this is well defined. And the next question is determine this object here in practice. Let me also give a name to this part. Part of the integrand of the numerator divided by the whole denominator. So let me call this here P of XJ. Okay? Basically what I want to show you is that a K 
can interpret this as a probability um, distribution. Well, what do I need to show for that? First of all, well, this down here is just a kind of normalization. Let's look at the numerator here. This is the exponent of, well, something at least real, with this V0 in addition it's even positive. Um, so the, yeah, it's actually, um, <coughs> so we have exponent e to the minus something divided uh, by a normalization and therefore it turns out that uh, first of all this p of xj is bigger or equal to zero it never gets negative because I have exponent of something real and if I look at, uh, well, if I calculate the integral over this here, j equal, where do I always start out, zero, um, p n minus one, p three x zero, p of x j. If I look at this here, well, then I do exactly what's actually here in the denominator. So, the integral over P is 1. <coughs> These two properties are sufficient to call something probability density. now for something physical to happen, but just I interpret it that way to be able to calculate that. Well, what I do now is I create random numbers. I create three n random numbers, which are basically, well, these coordinates which enter here. I do not create them arbitrarily, but I create them according to this distribution, p of xj. And then I do this very, very often, which means I sample in the end this distribution here, and I calculate then an expectation value of this operator. And by sampling this here very often, I simulate the whole integral. very very often
basically, um, so is there anyone here who has never heard about Monte Carlo integrations? So who has heard about Monte Carlo integrations? I mean, just to give you the, the simplest example how one would do such things, or, or why this is a good idea of doing that. Uh, suppose I want to calculate the area of a circle. Okay? Now let's do the four. So, I mean, usually then you would... So the, the classical analytical way would be parameterize the curve of a circle, or let's say of a half circle, and then integrate that by well, getting, the, getting the surface under this half circle and then times two, and then one has it, okay? This one can do, um, but there is another way of doing that, and this is with random numbers. Suppose I have here a quarter circle. And now I just create random numbers with, I always create a pair of random numbers. Um, actually, again, this is one, this is zero, this is one again. I create a pair of random numbers between zero and one. So such a pair is somewhere in here, okay? And now I do this very, very often and count how many times my pair is in here? I do this very often, which means I get some pairs which are here and some which are outside. And now I count how many of these guys are inside. For that I don't need to know a lot of properties from this circle. I just basically calculate the distance to the origin and if it's smaller than one it's inside and if it's bigger than one it's outside. Okay? And now I count all events where I'm inside here, and I divide this number by all events which I made. And I think it's intuitive to see that if I do this very, very often, I basically fill this, uh, fill this square, okay? If I do this very often, my claim is, this gives, and, and if I only count these, the events which are inside, divided by the total number of events, in the end, this approaches the ratio between, well, this area here divided by the area of the whole square. Okay? So this is very intuitive that this happens, also mathematically one can show that. And this is, a, so this is an example of doing a Monte Carlo integration. One does not do any integration at all, one just counts events. And in this case, uh, in a sense, the, in this case, the distribution which I'm after is just, well, distribution being in a sense one inside of the sphere and zero outside. Whatever is outside is weighted with zero, whatever is inside is weighted with one. So that's why I... I um, I count all events inside with a, well, with a factor 1, I count them, and I do not count these guys outside. And that's all. And in the end, if I do this often enough, uh, this really gives uh, a quarter of the, um, of the area of a circle. Try that if with your most favorite uh, numerical program. This is really nice how, how this comes out. Um, and here, I mean, it's, well, slightly more involved. One does not create uh, a pair, a pair of uh, parameters, but one creates a 3n tuple. One does not create it with this probability distribution, which is 1 somewhere and 0 somewhere else, but with a continuous distribution. But otherwise, it's the very same thing. So one can do this for a one-dimensional integral. <laughs> as this, or one can also do it with a multi, for a multi-dimensional integral. And actually one can show whatever other integration method you would use, now numerical ones. The larger your number of integration variable gets, the more efficient is doing Monte Carlo. 
as compared to doing this really numerically in, in this case, uh, three n dimensions. And we want to do it for a large number of, uh, of capital N. Okay, so this is uh, how that is done. And uh, so the message is one can do that for large capital N numerically. Um, okay, then before we make the break, then let me just already give you an, an outlook. This is what essentially, now one translates that to quantum field theory, we will do that. Um, and one does that for, well, the theories one is interested in. For example, for the theory of the strong interaction QCD. In practice, of course, one needs a lot of computing power to do that. One has to generate a large number of 3n tuples and I want capital N already to be large. So each tuple is already large. And I do this very often. In practice, um, such lattice QCD calculations, the best calculations we have at the moment, this is some, these are programs which run over several years. So one initiates that uh, basically on the, on the largest computers we have in the world. Uh, lattice QCD is something which in practice now also drives the, uh, which drives the, the technical achievements. The computer industry is of course interested in finding problems which are at the limit of being solvable. I mean, one of the typical problems is, uh, of course, to create computers which can play chess. Uh, but nowadays they are better than the best chess players in the world, so one has to look for other um, demanding things. And Lattice QCD is one of them. So they, they, even the industry likes to work together with uh, nuclear physicists or energy physicists uh, who define problems uh, which, were, which are at the technical limit. Feasibility. And that is QCD is something like that. Um, and of course, it has this uh, appeal that it asks very fundamental questions like what is the mass of the proton and things like that. So, in practice, what's done is that one creates exactly such distributions and one takes the best computers in the world and creates a large amount, a large sample of such tuples, so many that one believes one has a good uh, coverage of doing the whole integration, and all this one stores, and only afterwards one starts calculating such expectation values. This has an advantage. It has the advantage that you can then change your questions. You can also ask for other operators and still, well, take these random distributions which you have created and uh, which you have created over several years and then do this averaging. This averaging does not take years. I mean, this is just basically adding, adding up uh, what you have created before. So this is how it's done in practice. Uh, that's why lattice QCD results typically take some years until you get better ones because then the next generation of computers have produced uh, well, better samples and we will, I mean, we will also see um, probably on Thursday, well, tomorrow or on Thursday um, well, why it's still a challenge to do that, so where are still problems. Okay, now I would suggest we make a break till quarter past two and uh, then, of course, I want to finish this whole, um, well, this, this whole setup by also talking briefly about time-dependent quantities, with the aim that you should see this one cannot so easily calculate numerically. Okay, now we make a break. To Um, so before I continue, some of you asked me about the homework task 3. Um, so obviously there's one problem how to do that. Um, so let me 
give you one more hint uh, how to do that. The, I mean, the challenge of this three body phase space is to, to split it up. Um, <laughs> Damn, you are too close here. <laughs> I was checking if everyone is back. But okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, task three from the first homework sheet. Uh, the challenge was to, to basically split up the three body phase space in two times the two body phase space. And the. So, I assume that all of you have done in one or the other way this first two body phase space. And then one obtains a result there, and this result, um, so if it's, um, I assume now that, that Max did it right, because I, at the moment I don't know it by heart, but the result is something like this. It's proportional to this. Does everyone agree on that? Uh, you also have that? Yeah, okay. Okay, then, then I assume it's right. Um, this has been evaluated in the most clever frame. And so this is the result in the frame where q vector is zero. Yeah. So actually, if q is mq, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. however you want to call this, yeah, um, q zero or or yeah. MQ, I mean, that's completely up to you. But, uh, but so is EQ in the right frame of Q? So it's M. M. Yes. Yeah, they're yeah, fine. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's then, in a sense, it's actually M12, because this is what yeah. Q squared is. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, so, I mean, I, whether you call this EQ or Q0 or MQ, um, yeah, this is one of the things, of course, we one has to consider. Okay, this is in a specific frame. Whenever you see an energy or a momentum, obviously what you have written down is not frame independent. Okay, so in this frame, the expression looks like that. In every other frame, the expression will look different. However, you know that what you have calculated in the beginning was Lorentz invariant, which means if you manage to rewrite this expression in a Lorentz invariant form, then it's true in every frame, because then it's Lorentz invariant. I know this always causes confusions. Uh, my way of explaining things is, is the following. You know that energy is frame dependent, the energy of a particle. The rest mass of a particle is not frame dependent. There is one frame where the energy of a particle and its rest mass agrees. This is in the frame where the particle is at rest. So there are frames, of course, where a Lorentz invariant quantity agree with a Lorentz non-invariant quantity. And in this frame, then obviously you can rewrite Lorentz dependent quantities in terms of Lorentz invariant ones. You just have to find the proper expression. How to do that here? So first of all is uh, what Elisabetta already said. This EQ here is, of course, um, I can write this if I want as an EQ square minus Q vector square because I'm in the frame where Q vector is zero, so this is for sure right. And this is square root of q square. And now it's Lorentz invariant. However, I can even go ahead and remember my q square is actually fixed. My q square is m12 square. There is no need to do that at this point, but one can already do it here. So from the other delta function, uh, basically when one introduced the q, uh, this here is then m12, and this is again Lorentz invariant. <coughs> so I can replace this here by m12. Now how about this? 
Well, now we need a clever way how to single out the three momentum. Probably there is more than one way how to do that. Um, my way is the following. The modulus of the three momentum shows up in another quantity, and this is the energy. So first of all, I would say my P3, I write as square root of E3 squared minus M3 squared. That's for sure okay. This, by the way, I mean, this is true for any frame. Um, but I'm left with the E3, which is also not Lorentz invariant. Now comes the trick. This is a trick to remember for a lifetime. Um, how do I get E3? Well, what do I have at my disposal when I want to have Lorentz invariant quantities? Well, of course, I have the masses of all my particles, and I can build scalar products. What do we have left? Well, we have the Q left and the P3. So, just for fun, let's do a scalar product of that. That's Lorentz invariant. Now, let's evaluate it in that frame where this here is true. Well, in this frame here, the Q vector is zero, which means this here is um, EQ times E3, and now remember we have already evaluated the EQ. This is M12 times E3, which means I can write the E3 in a Lorentz invariant way. here is a Lorentz invariant expression. There are only scalar products showing up. Um, <coughs> well, and that's of course what I want. So I can, if I want, I can also rewrite this here as a... I think it's square. Uh, did I miss a square somewhere? Yeah, Probably. Oh yeah, here there's a square. to wonder about now. Uh, this is 1 over m12 times square root of uh, q dot p3 square minus m3 square m12 square. So again, the message is this expression is valid in this particular frame. However, in this frame, I can rewrite this guy as M12, and I can rewrite the P3 as this Lorentz invariant expression. And therefore, I can rewrite this whole expression in a Lorentz invariant way. And this is then for sure true in any frame, because it's Lorentz invariant. It's manifestly Lorentz invariant. And then one. I mean, and then next, of course, you have to do now the, uh, the Q and the P3 integrations. So basically the problem was the P3, because then when you go in another frame of reference, if you would need P3, you are losing something. Yes. Yes, the problem is the P3, because that this agrees with P3 vector modulus is only true in this Q equals zero frame, but afterwards you want to integrate over Q vector. 
So you cannot stay for the whole integrand, you cannot stay in that frame. So you have to rewrite it in a Lorentz invariant way, and, and this is then for sure a valid expression because you started out with a Lorentz invariant double integral. Okay, um, back to um, back to the path integrals. Um, so last time we started out with we want to know expectation values, and I split that up in time independent quantities and time dependent. So now I come back to the time dependent <laughs> ones. Um, <coughs> So for time-dependent um, operators, if I talk about time-dependent operators, this means automatically I'm in the Heisenberg picture. All the manipulations we have done to obtain this formula, which I've erased, uh, were in the Schrodinger picture. But we cannot be in a Schrodinger picture at the moment because we are interested in time-dependent operators, not in time-dependent um, uh, physical states. <coughs> so we want to put our information basically in the operators and take it out from the states, which one actually always does in quantum field theory. Um, okay, so let me be a little bit more specific what one is typically interested in. A typical operator is indeed that one creates somewhere something, then let the system alone, let things scatter and so on, and in the end take out something. This take putting in and taking out I can write in terms of operators. So a typical operator would be something which has information at two different times. Any operator for one at a time t1 and later on an operator uh, O2 at time t2. Um, so later on means that t2 is bigger than t1. And then, um, we are still interested in this quantity here, and um, I now insert a complete set of states to evaluate these operators, and I evaluate these operators, well, necessarily at the times where I want to know them. So I insert now, for example, I insert uh, position eigenstates. Well, if these are operators as functions of positions, then these is a function of positions at this time. And then to evaluate them, in a sense of having matrix elements, um, well, I need to insert then the position eigenstates at this time. I put the position eigenstates because we are in the Heisenberg uh, picture. Ah, I have said that. Um, the position eigenstates are time dependent. Okay, so I insert now two times position operators which I call here initial and final because, I mean, I'm interested in this initial time T1 and in the final time T2. Um, and I have here my psi 0 operator 2 at T2 and I have here a final uh, a state which is an eigenstate to the position operator and since the position operator depends on time, so does its eigenstate. And, as I said, I do this, of course, where I want to evaluate this guy. 
and an appearance state xf t2 and uh, my O1 t1 um, <coughs> Um, sorry, this is not what I want. Um, and of course I want to evaluate this guy here at x1, so I plug in here an x i t1 x i t1 o1 t1 psi uh, 0. Okay, so what have I done? I have inserted two times unity here. One unity is this D3X1 um, cat bra combination, and one unity is this D3XF. This combination, and the reason again why I've done that is I want to evaluate this guy here at the proper time, and this guy here at its proper time. And what I have now picked up is a kind of additional matrix element between the eigenstates of my position operator at time t1 projected on the eigenstates of my position operator at time t2. Which means this here splits up into something which is specific for the operators, which is this guy and this guy, and something which concerns the time evolution of my system, which is contained in here. This brings me from T1 to T2. This has to do with the Hamiltonian of my system, whereas the rest here is of course specific how the operators look like. <coughs> Therefore, the central generic quantity here is the so-called transition amplitude. And now let me evaluate this. This is time-dependent Heisenberg picture. But this I can also rewrite as um, so let me see what this here is, this is the Schrodinger picture. And of course in the Schrodinger picture things are uh, well, much more how one is used to it. Um, the time dependence basically is now in these uh, operators again and not in these eigenstates. Um, and I can put that together to an XF uh, e to the 
minus i h t2 minus t1 x i. <coughs> now what you should see now is that this object here is formally very similar to what we started out last time. Last time we had this operator e to the minus beta h. So we also had the Hamiltonian, but the coefficient was different. And remember, from this beta, we then created this path integral, these multiple integrals, by uh, splitting up the operator in several small bits, expanding that as a Taylor expansion, and so on. So therefore, I won't do that again now, but just refer to what we did last time for the e to the minus beta h and actually what's written also in the Zernicki textbook uh, in this path integral chapter. This is much closer to this here. Um, and there, uh, one can also derive a corresponding path integral. Um, so I just copy basically now from what we did last time to here um, by identifying things which are, are similar. Um, So this is formula, formal, formally um, similar to e to the minus beta h. Um, and therefore one can identify, well just in the formulas we had before, we can identify beta with i times minus t1. Okay, if I do that, in whatever I have done last time, if I identify the beta with i times t2 minus t1, I can just copy these expressions and get an expression for this object here. I'm a little bit oversimplifying here uh, concerning actually boundary conditions because uh, last time we started out with some state and ended up with the same, whereas here we start with one state and end up with a different one. Um, but uh, up to that, which one can adjust by well, knowing what is the final well, variable which one does not integrate over, uh, one can basically derive the, the same thing. Um, <coughs> Okay, then one obtains a path integral representation. here because anyway I want to show you afterwards that one cannot calculate this numerically. Um, so it's of formal importance one can also derive a lot of nice quantum mechanical and quantum field theory things from that but it's not suited for a, for a brute force Monte Carlo integration as um, I will argue in a moment. Okay, therefore I do not write down the normalizations and so on, so all this what I write down is proportional to the quantity I have here. So let me start out with these usual integrals. And with the understanding capital N should be very big. Um, and one then has an exponential here, minus i delta t and the sum um, k running from 0 to n minus 1 1 half m x um, k plus 1 minus x k 
came over delta t now square plus um, v of x k and then this closes this bracket and that. <coughs> And the delta t is just what was the delta tau before over i, or in other words, it is uh, um, t2 minus t1 over capital N. <coughs> now let me rewrite this a little bit. Um, to show you how else one can interpret what one has here. What's written here in this exponent, let me, um, well, bring in this delta t here and, um, and also this minus. Uh, sorry, I forgot one thing at first. There is an i hint here because um, it was delta tau which showed up there and the delta tau is i times delta t. Okay, now I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. I put in the minus and the delta t in here and just leave the i in front. So this is i times sum over, over k um, times delta t. Times um, one uh, times one half m x k plus one minus x k over delta t squared minus v of x k. Okay, so what has happened here? This i square is a minus, this cancels this minus here. Uh, so, so I've taken basically out this i, whereas this minus here with a plus yields a minus. <coughs> if capital N becomes very, very big, the delta t becomes smaller and smaller, and then actually this sum over all positions times delta t becomes closer and closer to an integral over t. So in a sense I can now understand this xk if you want as a position at a time t and then this here is nothing but a position difference at well normalized to a time difference which becomes smaller and smaller so the whole thing uh, approaches a velocity. So this here approaches integral dt. This here approaches, uh, again, for capital N becoming larger and larger, this here approaches x dot, this whole thing in the brackets. Um, and therefore, if you look at the whole thing here, this here is one half m x dot squared minus potential. This is kinetic energy minus potential energy. So this is the uh, this is the Lagrangian, and then I integrate here over it. So this becomes an integral dt over the action. Which means one can write such expectation values in terms of the action of the problem and integrating over all, uh, well, 
integrating over for every time over all positions. This is what this multiple integral here is. Okay, so this is a nice formal expression. Um, however, from a practical point of view, you should see the following. Uh, well, this Lagrangian produces some real numbers given different axes here where I integrate over. But then I have exponent i times this action. Now suppose I do a variation in the sense that um, I change slightly my integration points. I mean, anyway, I have to cover all integration points. Then what changes is the action, but I always have exponent i times an action. Exponent i times an action, if I split that in real and imaginary part, gives a sine and a cosine, and both are functions which can become positive and negative. And now I integrate over all possibilities with all types of uh, results for my action here. I integrate over everything, not only over a classical path, but over for each time over all possible positions. So this is something which becomes as often positive as negative, and I have to keep track of that. This is numerically extremely challenging, and in practice, if one does that, very, very often, or basically adds up positive and negative numbers all the time, which makes it numerically extremely unstable. It changes very often drastically its value. This is not the case if one has an exponent over a negative real number, what we had before. There it's everything nicely damped. Whereas here, it's wildly oscillating. So numerically, this is not feasible. So this is nice from a principal point of view, but uh, from a practical point of view, having in mind now simulations, even in quantum field theory, this is unpractical. Okay, let me summarize this a little bit. Um, and then I want to come to um, time-independent operators coming back to what we discussed last time. Which time independent operators one can actually address? What are typical questions one can address there? So, but first, uh, let me summarize that such that we can translate that easily to quantum field theory. So, this is a short summary. So, for any operator, Um, uh, one can express the expectation value you, we were after takes here the action, e to the i times the action, this is what one has here, e to the i times the action, s. And basically, that's why I didn't bother about normalization constants here, they anyway drop out. So 
formally this is valuable, um, however numerically it's not. Um, however, for time independent quantities I can use another trick, my trick from last time. So this is also true for time independent quantities, but uh, for time independent one can even do better. guys O twiddle to distinguish that from the O's. Um, there we can express the expectation value beta to zero, again one takes here a path integral, one has e to the actually a Euclidean action uh, which depends on beta, one has the operator one is interested in and normalizes to the well, same object. And let me now write down the, this object here is just what we had at the beginning. <coughs> One obtains that by an integral zero beta over d tau. Actually, one can also take a Lagrange function here. Um, however, um, all this is so-called Euclidean. Last time I have derived this in a very different way, however with this identifications that one can for arbitrary time dependent guys write all this in terms of an action or in other words an integral over the Lagrange function, I can reinterpret what I have done last time and say well what I actually have there is also something like an action. Um, well, not quite, because what I had last time was not something like a time evolution, but it was something like a statistical sum. Um, so whatever I have, um, I can, from the Lagrangian of my system, I can obtain a Euclidean Lagrangian by just replacing the time argument formally by an imaginary time argument. This brings me like here from a time evolution to such an object and um, well in that way I obtain a so-called Euclidean Lagrange function integrating it from zero to beta I obtain a Euclidean action um, 
And as I've shown in the beginning, um, well, this is an absolutely well-defined expression which one can calculate by Monte Carlo. Um, and calculate this here. So next time I will present you two typical quantities, time independent quantities, um, which one uses basically in lattice QCD. Again, I will do that first for quantum mechanics. And then, um, basically, I want to show you some lattice QCD results and discuss with you, uh, well, where are still, well, where are the features of these calculations and where are still some problems uh, with these calculations. Okay, uh, I think there is no point that we start these, um, these typical time-independent operators now, so let's stop a little bit earlier.